Hey everybody, it's Eric Torenberg, co-founder, partner of Village Global, a network-driven venture firm. And this is Venture Stories, a podcast covering topics relating to tech and business with world-leading experts. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Village Global's Venture Stories. I'm here today joined by a very special guest, Addie Lerner of Avid Ventures. Addie, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Eric. It's great to be here. So, Addie, by, by way of introduction, why don't you give the, the backstory uh, behind Avid Ventures and, and, and why you set out to, to, to do this fund? Absolutely. So I started Avid because I thought there was a different way to work very closely with founders at the really crucial series A and B stages in their founding journeys and thought that my experiences as a growth and venture investor could bring a unique functional skill set around being this strategic financial advisor or outsourced strategic CFO to founders. And, And that's what I'd found a lot of success with personally when I was at General Catalyst and before that at General Atlantic. Um, really bringing that growth lens and skill set to help earlier stage companies grow even faster, more efficiently. So having been at a number of large firms, uh, including Goldman Sachs, as well as GA and GC, I was fortunate to pick up on a lot of things I really loved about these investment platforms, um, but had a lot of ideas about uh, how with a a smaller firm that was specifically focused on Series A and B, specifically built to have a collaborative investing strategy, we could take a very different approach and drive outsized returns for our LPs by doing so. Interesting. Unpack more this sort of the gap that, that you identified and yeah. um, how you solve for it. Yeah. So the structure of a traditional venture capital firm, especially an early stage one, take a series A firm, um, especially a series A firm that's part of a multi-stage platform where you have a fund size that maybe it originally started as a $200, $300 million series A fund, and now all of a sudden you're investing in Series A deals out of a $2 billion fund, the math just doesn't work because you're writing, well, these days you're writing very large Series A's check, at a checks, but you're writing um, a 10 maybe $15 million investment into the Series A. You also then are basically reserving at least that same amount for your pro rata. And so all of a sudden, for a very early stage company with a lot of risk, you're mentally committing $30 million. And so if you are a partner at a very large partnership and you only make two, maybe three Series A bets a year, it really fundamentally changes the risk appetite you have for those deals, one. And two, even if you have a 10x outcome on a Series A check, um, even if it's a 15 times outcome on a Series A check, the math just doesn't move the needle for returning the fund. So it really changes the incentives I found of very large multi-stage firms and funds that try to do early stage. It also fundamentally has changed the math for smaller Series A focused funds who are now competing with these multi-stage platforms to lead these ever-growing deals. And so I wanted to figure out a way just from a, a fund structure and strategy standpoint to come up with a different type of investment strategy that could still drive outsized outcomes, ideally keeping fund sizes small, but do it in a way that is hyper collaborative, not sharp elbowed, um, and actually is help serve the needs of a founder and company. Yeah. It's really interesting because there's been, you know, some chatter about the sort of, you know, great barbell that's happening at VC where people say hey, the way to win is either go, you know, super big that you're this aggregator or, you know, super small where you're the specialist. And, and you can get into, you know, sort of anything because of your because of your nimbleness. Whereas you seem to have found somewhere, uh, like some niche in the, niche in the middle that that has uh, has been under under tapped. Yeah, I would say our our sort of specialist focus. It's not sector, although we have we've done a lot of fintech, which I'm sure we'll chat about. But it really is around two things. One, it's around our investment approach, which is we're not leading A's or B's. We're writing small. $1 million checks into a Series A, staying super close to the company, being disproportionately helpful in a specific function area, this outsourced strategic CFO function area, which is the second piece. And then we're trying to earn the ability, or we call it the privilege, to write a much larger check into a subsequent round, again, alongside a lead investor. So we're taking a follow-on approach um, in order to get into the best companies and get more capital into our winners. And we're also differentiating ourselves by really relying on our growth modeling and, and financial 
analysis or strategic finance skill set. Yeah. And and what what some people might might ask, hey, you know, any deal that is doing tremendously well is is going to, you know, be more and more competitive and harder and harder to increase ownership over time. So wh- why are you thinking about increasing over time as opposed to getting it up front? Because do you think it's just harder to get it up front than it is to get it later? Or? I think it comes back down to the risk profile, um, especially in this environment. I love our strategy because it means we can treat our $1 million checks into Series A companies as our seed bet, the way a lot of seed firms or multi-stage firms will throw small checks into the seed in order to have that shot on goal later on. We can actually take what I think is appropriate risk at the seed or at the Series A because our model actually expects uh, the majority of our companies to go to zero. I actually don't think that'll happen based on how the portfolio is shaping up, but the model is built such that we can take that kind of risk to have a ton of zeros so that we get at least two totally outsized outcomes that we can then pile capital into at the later stages. And that drives the whole model. Yeah. And and so you're talking about you love this model in this environment. T- talk more about that. Uh, because in, in a world where these you know valuations are untethered from fundamentals and have just sort of kept uh, kept, kept rising, what does that mean for for your business? And how do you how do you underwrite in that environment? Yeah, totally. So we we built this strategy actually in 2019 before the world sort of well changed in a number of ways. But you know, as I mentioned, I actually think the strategy works really well in this kind of valuation environment. It it has made us think even more critically about how we underwrite. The way I've always thought about underwriting early stage businesses, um, but especially it's important when valuations at entry are totally wild, is actually starting from what do you have to believe for this to be an outlier outcome? What do you have to believe for this company to become a $5 billion, $10 billion company? And we sort of underwrite based on our experience of looking at best in class growth companies across business models to understand what those businesses look like at scale. And then we sort of back into what are the key drivers or assumptions that you need to have conviction in to get there. And then we triangulate, okay, do we believe the market opportunity is there for this product? Do we believe that there is a any sort of data points that we can get to date based on whether it's some sort of revenue numbers or increasingly it's more just initial execution? And then the third part of the triangle is the founder and the founding team. And do we really want to bet on this founder to go execute on that massive vision? Do we believe that they can go do it? And so we sort of start from there and then back into what is the initial price that we're being asked today? We're not setting the price here usually. Um, And can we make that math work both to return our target case that fits into our model, but also can we believe in an upside case that could return the entire fund? What is the calculus on determining whether you wanted to, uh, because you you sort of, I'm sure, navigated the idea maze of what's the right fund strategy. How did you think through whether it makes sense to lead versus not lead? Because I've, I've seen a bunch of the not lead at, at sort of pre-seed and seed, you know, Box Group and, and others, uh, but haven't seen it so much. So, uh, you know, l- later on, how did you how did you think that, 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 how did you come to that? Well, candidly, part of it was, how do I play to my strengths of being a yeah. Series A and B investor with a yeah. fund one of $72 million? So a little bit of it was was sort of being creative around what's possible. I do think um, as Avid evolves, as we raise future funds, um, stay tuned for fund two strategy. But I think you might see us doing more probably post A and series B leader co-lead checks. I do think increasingly, especially in this market, it's really important to be able to, in order to have a seat at the table for allocation discussions, to be able to be proactive and preemptive. We're really fortunate that we have a number of LPs who have very deep pockets and a really strong interest in co-investing alongside us and and have underwritten us so they can move super quickly to to come in alongside us. But I think when we can say, yeah, we're going to write you a $20 million check out of the fund to co-lead or lead this this round, that that is pretty powerful and meaningful. And I think still the math can work out really well for it to be a co-lead check where we can be very flexible about bringing in other insiders, bringing in a new lead whatever makes the most sense for the founder and company. That to me is the holy grail of a flexible investment strategy. Um, it's not flexible so we can do all the stuff. It's flexible so we can make yeah. the round or the investment work out optimally for the founder and company. Yeah. How do you think Series A, uh, like more pure Series A investors, how should they be reacting in this environment? It's tough. It's really tough. Like if I were a multi-stage firm, I would, I think I would do what a lot of them have been doing, which is yeah. even more active at speed, where your dollars go further. Because Series A right now, let's be honest, 
you're basically investing in seed stage companies at what formerly were a series B prices, which is like the worst risk trade ever. So, you know, I, I do think that, and I, and we've seen it with all of our series A fund friends, um, including those who are more pure play series A, they've, they've just been doing a lot more seed. They've held their noses and they've made some series A bets where they just have a ton of conviction about the upside. And we certainly have too. And I think, again, especially in fintech, where I think the the upsides, both certainly because of public market valuations, but also just because of the massive tailwinds in financial services globally more generally, mean that you can have these really outsized outcomes, valuations of companies that were not thought to be possible previously. But I think it's made Series A investments in more traditional software companies even a lot harder. We actually just passed on an investment last week where we just loved the founder, loved the super sleepy industry and the thesis. And where it priced was, you know, more than 2x where we thought it should have. And you just don't see that necessarily upside potential to justify holding your nose there. Yeah. And, and, and that was just based on traction relative to their peers or re- relative to, I guess, where you thought it could get 10x or, or, or I guess, what, what was the calculus you, you made? Yeah. So so we um, did sort of what I referred to earlier, which is we said, okay, how big can a company get in this space? And we, we did our market sizing work. We looked at sort of the P&L of that later stage company. We also looked at where we thought multiples would reset to. Yeah. You know, we, we assume at least 50% multiple compression for any of our exit underwrites. And you know, I, I even think that to be more conservative, you want to go less than that. But in doing all that valuation work, I think you really you had just went harder for this business and this industry to see a three to $5 billion outcome. Yeah in a way that it's easier to envision those outcomes for a lot of payments and other fintech businesses. Yeah. And I'm sure there's a lot of survivorship bias to to what I'm about to say, but it seems that often when investors think about the Anto portfolio or the mistakes that they made, of course, they passed on, you know, way more companies that didn't end up working out. um, But they'll often say they underestimated the market size that they were, you know, doing comps and just be, and then for whatever, you know, for a number of reasons, they they underestimated. How do you sort of, make sure in, in your, when you're doing sort of your diligence and sort of value evaluation estimations um, or exit estimations that you're not underestimating market size. Absolutely. We ask ourselves this all the time. My partner, Tali Vogelstein was at Bessemer before she joined us at Avid and, you know, Bessemer is seen time and time again in their anti-portfolios. They always have underestimated market. That's where they've gotten wrong. That's where they've gotten it right with some of their winners. They just, um, they didn't realize how big it could get because the market was literally created by companies, you know, like a Shopify. What we do when we do this, what do you have to believe analysis and think about how big the company could get is, and we bake this into our cases. We have our sort of target case based on market size, the penetration we think the company can get to, a bottoms up analysis on sort of acquisition math. But then we also do think about, maybe, you know, obviously we don't know what we don't know, but we do think about what else could this company become? What are other services or products they could offer? We really try and lean into this upside case as much as possible and give them credit for those things we're not thinking about and going beyond core market size. Um, you know, it's how we underwrote our investment in Alloy originally. So we came into the Series B of Alloy uh, last summer. Um, we stayed super close to the company and you know, they're absolutely crushing it right now because of the wild tailwinds and growth within FinTech. Um, sort of like a Stripe, how Stripe grew on the back of wild tailwinds in e-commerce. Alloy is doing the same in terms of the creation of new fintechs and just the rapid growth of fintechs, in addition to their core um, bank and, and credit union and financial institution customer base. And so with Alloy, you know, they have a number of different products that they, they offer. They have this onboarding KYC and identity product. They also have been building and are just starting to launch now an ongoing transaction monitoring product, as well as a credit underwriting product, both using the same orchestration of third-party data approach as part of the core onboarding product. And so when we did our underwrite, we actually only underwrote our target case around the core onboarding product. And we leaned into, okay, how big could credit get? How big could transaction yeah. monitoring get? What would the attach rates have to be? What would the ACVs have to be? And that's how we could underwrite the, well, this works out. This could be a pretty, pretty wild outcome. And you know, now as we've seen the company really start to get great traction around these other products, we've seen the market evolve. We can now understand how that might come more to light. And of course, there are parts of the market that we might not even be seeing or understanding that can make it even bigger. But we really do try to suspend disbelief. Um, and this is not just our thinking. We're obviously listening to our founders and, and their yeah. vision. We like to let them inspire us. But but we do try to really stretch on what the upside case could be. Totally. I want to transition into, in, into, into fintech. And, and before going into it, maybe we could just trace your 
sort of journey a bit because you were uh, you know, you've been an investor for a while. You've invested in a number of, 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 of sectors. Trace your sort of bullishness on, on fintech as, as a focus for, for you. Yeah, that's a great question. So at the beginning of my career, I was doing no fintech. I was investing um, at Goldman Sachs and the Special Situations Group, which is basically investing Goldman's balance sheet capital into various mid-market companies. Um, not only was this like just post Volcker, so there's just a ton of sensitivity around you know anything that could potentially suggest Goldman was investing in fintech companies that they shouldn't be, but also um, because of the bank holding company rules, there were ownership restrictions on how much Goldman could own of any company it made a minority investment in that was a financial services business. And so as a general rule, my team sort of ignored those, those companies. At General Atlantic, we were very sector focused. And GA obviously is more of a growth stage shop. At the time, so this was 2014 through 2017, we're still in the very early innings of a lot of fintech companies. So the financial services and internet technology team, the latter of which is my team, where I work closely with Anton Levy, who, who's actually a big influencer of our, of our double down strategy and a good friend and advisor of the fund. We didn't have as much overlap. The, the team was really investing in a lot of financial services businesses, which was quite interesting to see and understand how core services companies are valued, how core um, financial product companies are valued on, on sort of um, a loan to book basis as opposed to, you know, fantasy revenue multiple. And so it was really a general catalyst um, where Adam Balkan and I did a number of fintech investments together that I, I sort of saw the potential um, of and the, the real market creation opportunity of fintech. And so the first investment I made at, at GC was Shift Technology. So that's a software company selling AI software to insurers to help them detect fraudulent claims and thus drive millions of dollars of savings to their bottom line and ultimately back to their customers. Shift actually just became a unicorn, which was really exciting to see. And the potential of technology to help these massive, hugely valuable financial services businesses was I think the first entree I had into FinTech to really understand how you could take a beautiful B2B software business model and apply that to legacy industries. I did that actually then with an investment in a company called Remesh, not a FinTech company, although per my thesis, we'll probably become one at some point. And so they, they, they are disrupting the market research industry using AI and software. I then spent a lot of time looking at consumer applications with FinTech and helped uh, GC make our investment into Monzo in summer, I guess it was 2018. And this was the Series E, although Monzo was still not even contribution margin break even at that point. And what I got really excited about there is just the absolute organic virality of the Monzo brand. So in some ways, it was actually a consumer brand investment around the product being a digital bank account for consumers. So I fell in love with the virality. Also, that went to show that financial services is actually one of the last frontiers where companies have been able to acquire consumers absolutely free um, because of uh, how underserved Consumers of all stripes are a little underserved consumers specifically for great financial services and products. And so in the last three years, we've just really seen consumer fintech take off, both because of just the, the lack of good services in this category, but also I think because of the innovation around payments and around fintech and banking. And that's actually, we can talk more about that. That's where I think actually the most exciting innovation is within fintech. Yeah, and then just to close it off, the, the last investment I made at, at GC specifically in fintech, um, is in a company called Rapid, which is a global alternative payments network. And that's where I got really smart on payments, traditional credit and debit payments or traditional for the U.S., as well as alternative payments, um, because the rest of the world has really leapfrogged the U.S. in terms of um, acceptance and usage of digital payments, e-wallets, um, certainly in Asia and Latin America. And so brought all those learnings, I think, to, to form my theses on a bunch of these sectors. Um, but it was really, you know, I was investing in fintech companies while also the foundation of this massive shift in financial services was happening. And I think COVID has only accelerated those tailwinds for the industry. Yeah. Let's go into a, a few of the, the ideas behind some of those some of those companies. Maybe let's start with, with your thesis around uh, every company being a, a, a fintech company. What when you unpack what, what this means and and how that's evolved in the last few years? Yeah. So you know the usual answer people are like, oh you're a fintech fund. I'm like, well we didn't start out that way. Yeah, our original thesis was to be generalists and to invest in fintech, software, and consumer internet. And actually, the latter two categories are sort of by default now also have high potential to be fintech companies. And so 80% of our portfolio is now fintech. 
And that really belies this belief we have that every company either is or is becoming a fintech company. And the reason we say that is because with the innovation around payments, with the innovation around how to engage with financial services, whether it is lending in an integrated way, you go to buy a Peloton, a firm helps you buy now, pay later. You open a new uh, trading account on Robinhood and your identity verification provider enables you to spin up your account immediately as opposed to in a traditional bank account, you might've had to go in person to actually go through KYC. We're seeing that the, the sort of enablement layer within FinTech has led to this massive wave of new FinTech companies and the enablement of non-financial services providers to offer financial services to their product, to their customers, either directly or through the use of embedded finance providers. So we see this, I think, most immediately with, for example, vertical software companies that are offering payments because they're touching the transaction volume and flow. You know, Toast's a really good example. So Toast is one of you know, the leading SMB restaurant and um, hospitality provider of payment services starting, you know, they started with this POS, um, but they now can power the entire SMB restaurant experience. And, and they've both acquired as well as built internally various credit, working capital, financial services solutions for their customers because no one knows their customers better than they do. They have all this usage data on their customers so they can underwrite a lot better. And it's an incremental product they can start to click um, fees on. By also handling the payments, which many companies like Toast do, they're able to um, basically clip pennies off of those transaction volumes as a pretty lucrative payment stream. And so what you also get is, you know, maybe there aren't a ton of SMB restaurants like growing super quickly and building empires, but you know, some of the beauty of like a Shopify is, you know, Shopify is a payments company. They started with this great software to help creators, like physical goods creators, not today's definition of creators, um, build and sell their products. And they were able to actually grow with a number of their underlying sellers um, and participate in that upside because they were taking a cut of that uh, processing revenue. Yeah. Uh, fintech often gets broken out into you know horizontal and vertical companies just, just like other sectors um you know horizontal banking and service solutions versus vertical you know point solutions um how do your companies uh use horizontal and vertical fintech solutions and and how, how do you think about that yeah definitely and this goes back a little bit to what i was talking about with this this idea of it's sort of like a perfect storm of enablement you see both innovation or really like upgrading around some of the functionality within financial services, like what Owl is doing with KYC and identity, what Rapid is doing within payments. Um, and then you're also seeing sort of distribution innovation in how companies are acquiring end users and providing those financial services to them. So, you know, example of that is a company um, currently called Bayou, but stay tuned for potential name change. So this is a, a new um, uh, business founded by Daniel Simon, who's one of the, the founders of Bread. And he is building a corporate expense and payments management system specifically for fleets. Now, unlike a number of companies that are going after large commercial trucking fleets, he is targeting SMB fleets. So think florists or HVAC repairmen who are sort of running around their city in small vans and a core part of managing their fleets who are driving around in these vans is giving them a fuel card to actually go buy fuel and, and maybe other products as well. There are two big legacy players in the space, Wex and Fleet Corps. Bayou is building a much better experience, both from a software perspective, a great UI, and from an actual payments experience. They're building an open loop network, which means you can use your card anywhere, not just at the gas stations that are integrated into their closed loop network, which is what Wex and Fleet Corps have essentially done. And what they're doing, it's quite differentiated, is they're building out distribution or go-to-market of hacks. Um, that will actually enable them to um, service this industry um, in, in a better way. Now, you know, there's nothing, yes, there are definitely innovations that they have around the, the way that they're building out payments and the way that they're building out the card, but that idea isn't super novel, right? They're, they're, you know, it's existed in a terrible form. There are other companies doing this more horizontally like Rex for you know, tech startups, but the innovation, and I think why they will grow so quickly is that they're serving this underserved population of SMB fleets that didn't have access to a good payment solution. And then this can be the entree wedge into being the more fulsome financial services provider for this end customer group, including potentially banking, including lending and credit. 
So I sort of think about those those vertically focused companies as as being best in class for their vertical because of a distribution edge that they're getting um, or that they might have versus some of the more horizontal enablement platforms. And there are two types of horizontal enablement if we sort of double click on that layer. I think there's both the generalists like FinTech as a service platforms like a unit or bond or Sinterra um, are basically enabling, whether it's FinTechs or non-FinTechs, like a retailer that wants its own branded credit card or their own branded buy calculator solution. They're providing the backend underwriting and financial services technology to help any customer become a FinTech. Truly really the definition of our thesis. Um, and then there are the more um, point solution focused enablement players like an Alloy, for example, or even a Nova Credit, um, which is one of our companies that is basically helping to uh, create one sort of global uh, language for credit. So starting by helping immigrants port their home country credit score into the U.S. And that is sort of, you know, a point solution enablement layer um, so they can help their end customers, currently very large banks, service these customers who look like they have no credit in the U.S., but really have very rich credit histories at home. Which do you think is um, has more opportunities for venture scale outcomes? Ooh, good question. I would say... The most interesting for venture scale outcomes, probably because we've already seen some of them, are that middle group. It's the point solution companies because they can enable and work with some of the largest banks and enterprises in the world um, to solve their identity management, their credit underwriting, their payments needs. Um, I'm very excited about some of the more vertically focused companies. I think we've seen some success stories there. You know, Chime is obviously a broader focused neobank, but at the end of the day, their whole original thesis, and I think why they found such instant product market fit, is that they were serving consumers who, for whom it meant everything to get paid a few days before payday. And they were really helping sort of bridge that financial services gap. And that's what enabled their virality in large part. We're also, we also have seen, you know, Service Titan become a very, very large and successful company servicing a very small, relative, air quotes, small niche of sort of service provider SMBs um, with a vertically focused software and you know, ultimately payments and fintech solution. So I think it's possible, but I do think the vertical that the vertically focused companies are focused on could end up being the TAM limiter until these companies are truly able to prove out all of these other financial service products that they want to be able to offer um, to their end customers. Yeah. But let's go deeper on on, on 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 neobanks for 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 a minute. How do you think about you know as sort of neobanks serve specific you know audiences um, and affinity groups? How do you think about you know how, how should people think about you know which are greenfield opportunity versus which are you know uh, more niche and have more limited uh, limited upside? Yeah. So um, you know, as much as I love Monzo and Monzo is totally crushing right now for what it's worth, which is very exciting to see. You know, I've always been a little bit skeptical of neobanks as, as being truly fintech companies. At the end of the day, I believe neobanks are, are just that. They are new banks. They are digital banks. But at the end of the day, they're still a bank. And when you acquire a banking license and when you become regulated, um, you, you become subject to all the um, unfun things that, that banks do. And that can really limit the nimbleness of tech startups. And so I think initially neobanks were so valuable, are so valuable, clearly still from valuation multiples, because they cracked a different kind of distribution. So it comes back to that distribution point where the real innovation is there. They figured out a totally untapped market. They figured out how to leverage virality and a beautiful product experience to get in the hands of um, consumers. But at the end of the day, they're providing the same ultimate technology, non-technology solution of banking. Same is true of Robinhood. Um, you know, Robinhood is enabling what has existed in, you know, less, you know, a, a poorer form for a while now, which is online trading. They've just done it in a totally gamified and, and easy to use way with a beautiful interface. And so, um, but they've tapped into a totally un- previously untapped market segment of Gen Z traders. And yeah. so, again, it's the distribution that I think is so valuable. But at the end of the day, and at, at ultimate exit, and you know, we'll see with I guess Robinhood's upcoming IPO plans, what the public markets will ultimately value these kinds of businesses at. And I think until or unless some of them are truly innovating around a platform innovation or technology innovation, 
that has something more to it than just the provision of a core financial service. These companies ultimately will be valued more um, like traditional banks. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Let's segue into um, into the future of of work, particularly as it relates to uh, remote work, and particularly as it relates to um, you know some of these payroll companies, you know, a deal and and others, you know, uh, having unicorn valuations recently. H- how do you make make sense of of, of this trend and, and these companies? So we've been totally enamored by these businesses. We've actually recently done a big dive in, into a number of these companies, and I actually spoke to all these founders who. Um, Actually, this will be announced tomorrow, so you'll get the sneak sneak preview that the the founders of of these leading remote work platforms are all angel investing into uh, Pento, which is a payroll automation platform based in London um, that we're very excited to be to be backing. This is a really interesting part of our thesis, which is global remote work is a massive, massive market, and the opportunity is only just beginning. At the end of the day, though. We are a little bit skeptical on how much value companies that are truly trying to be horizontal HRAS or or HR software providers will ultimately be able to accrete versus more specific point solution companies or companies that really own the infrastructure for global uh, both payments as well as the legal and compliance piece. So our investment in Pento is actually a bet on the payroll automation piece of the market. All Pendo does is payroll automation. They um, are doing it right now in Denmark and the UK. They're expanding to a couple of other countries in Europe. And it's great because all of these um, remote work players like remote.com and Deal will hopefully partner with them to do the local hard work of true payroll automation. The winners, I think, in the global remote work space will be those companies that have built out the deep infrastructure. Um, It's not necessarily proprietary to build out local entities in each country that you want to offer your service for. So it is a little bit of a um, race to capital and race to be able to penetrate these markets to be the first winner. But I don't see a ton of barriers to entry. So I think there will be multiple winners in this space. And that's why I think we're seeing these companies raise massive rounds. Um, They all have slight differentiation. Our understanding is that Papaya Global focuses a little bit more on the core software enablement of, of sort of HR software, whereas remote and deal are going a little bit more after the payments piece and really like the legal and compliance um, for remote contractors and employees. Ultimately, our belief is when we think remote.com has done a very good job of sort of being a leader here so far, our belief is that actually having the local integrations in every country that you're enabling your end customers to have employees or contractors out of is critical. It's sort of a little bit of a, in a payments world, sort of a like Stripe versus rapid approach. Stripe, their whole um, philosophy on building is to touch the metal, to be as close to the payment rail as possible. Whereas rapid has grown so big so quickly because they've basically been a network of networks and then working backwards to touch the metal or to to drive those integrations. It's a little bit of what we're seeing with the remote.com deal approach of remote going very deep, only directly at first, at the expense of not being able to cover certain markets and having customers potentially use additional players for that addition, for that coverage. Um, and Deal's approach of saying, great, we're going to build direct all the way through, but we're also going to have um, local partners who we're going to work with in the interim. And their goal is having that total coverage. So very interesting approaches. I do think there will be multiple winners, as we've seen there are in payments. Um, but what makes me so excited about the potential of the space is that when we talk to any of our portfolio companies or many founders um, who we talk to over the course of the week um, and ask them what they're doing for their remote work, just because we're curious which, you know, which company seems to be winning, a lot of them say something like that exists. They're like, wow, we have you know five contractors in like four different countries around the world, and it's like a total pain to manage, but wow, this sounds awesome. So um, I just think that there's going to be a huge, huge rush to these platforms whether that justifies the current valuations and, and whether or not that rush has already been factored into the, the relative multiples, totally untethered from fundamentals, I think is yet to be proven out. That, that, that makes sense. L- let's segue it a bit into uh, emerging uh, fintech or, or fintech and emerging markets. Um, there's this sort of, you know, uh, X for Y, you know, we, we did a, an affirm for, uh, in Latin America called uh, Adi, 
there's all sorts of, uh, you know, we were talking about neobanks, all sorts of these these models where we're just trying to, you know, plaid for X uh, for region. H- how do you think about the ones that that will work versus the ones that are, are, are least likely to work? Yeah, definitely. So, and you know, it's interesting, when I was at General Atlantic, I saw a lot of these X for Y companies popping up in the Middle East in particular. Kareem was sort of like the Uber for Egypt and the MENA region. And when you find a business model that works in one geography, it's, you know, chances are it'll work super well in others. Um, you know, we've seen food delivery work really well across geographies, ride sharing, um, et cetera. What I find most interesting in the X for Y approaches is where there is a local distinction um, or uh, sort of a, something endemic to the geography or market that makes that business model even more attractive um, or that you can do a, a, a tweak on that business model um, and, and uh, have a perhaps find moats or perhaps find competitive advantages. A few examples, iBuying is a very popular X for Y model we've seen emerge, um, especially in Latin America. We saw the, the recent loft announcement. There are a number of iBuyers um, being built out of Mexico. Um, Hobby is a leader out of Colombia. and what we really like about eye buying in Latin America versus eye buying in the States. And first, eye buying in the States is a high volume, low margin business where Zillow and Open Door are beating each other over the heads, competing down margin on the core eye buying product as much as possible. And so they now have to actually make all margin back in ancillary services they're trying to sell on top, like title and escrow services, um, agency services, et cetera. In Latin America, well, a few things are different. First, there's no MLS the way that there is in the U.S. So there's no sort of central listing of all um, rental and sale properties that create a transparent data asset. So without that, there's a real opportunity in countries like Mexico or Colombia to actually build out that data set. And the way to first do that is to actually create the inventory yourself, i.e. buy the home, refurbish it, and sell it. And then all of a sudden, you're sort of creating a standard of these prices that are feeding into your MLS. You can then become a third-party marketplace um, and have then even more data points and create a really interesting data asset. So whereas an open door in the U.S. is all about sort of volume of sales and, and sort of flipping pennies, in Latin America, it's actually about building a really proprietary data asset with a capital-intensive business model to see if you get there. So I really like that sort of thesis where there's something really interesting about the region um, that can make the the business a lot more interesting and attractive. Yeah. Uh, are there other examples that come to mind of, of basically yeah, how geos leapfrog yeah. certain you know financial service technologies to accelerate these opportunities? Definitely. I think in Europe, open banking is like a regulatory uh, dynamic that has enabled companies like Tink. And True Layer and Yappily to all build really interesting plaid like platforms. Um, and they, they're all doing it in sort of slightly different ways. But I think most investors in the space would agree that um, moving beyond screen scraping, which is a dip, originally how plaid was sort of able to aggregate the, the data that they would then port um, into their customers uh, through APIs, is actually can be innovated on with open banking, which mandates that banks. Um, actually have to create APIs that end companies can API into to gather that data. So you don't have to, as Plaid does, borrow effectively a user's credentials, log in on their behalf, and then screen scrape the information on the page. It's a much more elegant, secure way of gathering that information. Um, and so while Plaid obviously is, is, is working to penetrate Europe, it's let, enabled these other companies to get a real head start because of this regulatory dynamic um, so they can build out a better technological product to solve that um, sort of API enablement for customer financial data solution that Platter um, sort of originally innovated on. You know, another example is B2B or corporate payments. You know, we've seen Rex and Ramp really dominate in the US. There are a number of players in, in various countries over, over in Europe who, who've done really interesting things with corporate cards. We're seeing a few really interesting players emerge in Latin America who are taking an approach not just of, okay, let's copy and paste this sort of every business needs a corporate card, so let's sell that plus software and money on the transaction growth. A lot of countries in Latin America are not as enabled from a sort of debit and credit rails perspective, and it's also just not the way that a lot of businesses have traditionally 
done purchases and payments. So a lot of the innovation in these companies in LATAM is actually around building out infrastructure, payments infrastructure rails. That, that's a pretty new approach to how payments are being done. Some risk there and that you don't necessarily have the cultural buy-in or um, behavior to build behind, but a massive opportunity if it's really more of sort of a payments infrastructure play as opposed to a pure sort of corporate hard play. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Zooming out a bit, where it all, uh, if at all, uh, excites you within crypto? Favorite crypto question. <laughs> I always get it at least once. So look, I think crypto is fascinating, a massive opportunity. I am a holder of various cryptocurrencies personally. Um, It is not my core competency as an investor. I put crypto um, in the same bucket as uh, deep infrastructure tech or um, cyber technology um, or biotech, where, as I call it, the line of code is the differentiator on a product or service. I'm not the right investor for it. I get really excited about productized technology and where I can invest behind that. So that's not to say never. I think we'll get to a point where um, applications of the blockchain will be more of a traditional uh, sort of B2B or or B2C application approach. We're not there yet. So until then, Avid will not be making crypto investments. Yeah. What about, uh, you you did this deep dive a a couple years ago on uh, elder care. Have you have you have you kept up there? Or have there any companies excited you there? How have you thought about that that space uh, as it's evolved? I definitely continue to track that space. I would love to see innovation in the elder care space. Unfortunately, it's one where I just have a really hard time. This is my conclusion at the time. It continues to be a really hard time understanding what the distribution hack is. Older adults are a really tough group to sell to, especially. Um, much older adults, uh, the elderly, because the end sort of user of a product, i.e. the um, 85-year-old woman in a nursing home, is probably not the buyer of the product you're selling her. It's either the nursing home as a B2B play, a B2C, or it's a consumer play and you're selling to her daughter, most likely. And the willingness to pay, the, the sort of transparency around products and services all of that has just gotten complicated by the complicated distribution chain. So it's the same way by selling to babies or children. Yeah. It's like can be interesting, but it's ultimately a tougher market for well, a number of other reasons. But yeah. the end user of the product is different than the purchaser. So, you're, so um, it complicates that product marketing as well. Totally. So, so from the angles that we discussed within fintech or, or other areas, what sort of your uh, either request for startups or areas that you're excited to see, you know, entrepreneurs pursue and, and that you could potentially see yourself uh, backing that you, that you haven't yet got involved in. Definitely. Well, given we always start and end our investment thesis with the founder, I guess my advice for folks who are currently founders or potentially aspiring founders is build what you deeply, deeply know and have a point of view on my favorite sort of totally trite uh, euphemism about, about this is, we want to be backing founders who just absolutely believe they were put on this earth to build their company. And that's very transparent too, when you first meet a founder, if they really believe that. And I think a lot of that comes from some personal experience, um, whether it's a personal experience or a, a work experience, but some personal experience, some insight that a founder is so passionate about that he or she just cannot stop until they build this company. Yeah. Uh, speaking of f- founder market fit, um, and, and and perhaps uh, cl- closing w- w- with this, the future for for Avid. One thing I'm curious about is how some firms, you know, think about. Oh, we want to be multi stage. You know, think of something like Thrive, perhaps, and, and their journey. And then other firms say, Oh no, we want to stick to our knitting. Maybe it's like first round or USV, where they had the potential to do it. But it, what differentiate? What, what do those people either have different in temperament or different in strategy? And I'm curious how, how you think about it for, for yourself. Yeah, it's a great question when we think about a lot. I think it comes back to what we were talking about a bit originally of how do you differentiate yourself? Are you trying to differentiate yourself with a specific sector or do you want to sort of differentiate yourself um, by just being best in class at, at all the stages, all the things? Um, I think there's a place for each in the ecosystem. For Avid specifically, the, the North Star of what we're building is staying true to 
making sure in whatever investment strategy we're pursuing, we are leveraging our skill set to help make our companies most successful in as collaborative a way as possible um, so that the company and the founders can have the best outcomes possible. And so in the near term, that will likely mean maintaining a lean investment team, keeping our funds tight, growing them a little bit, but, but keeping them tight so we can stick to our core collaborative strategy, even if we start to write slightly larger double down checks where we're co-leading around, even if we um, you know, increase our toehold checks slightly, we still want to keep those that same collaborative ethos. You know, look, I'm not a seed investor. I never will be a seed investor. I really love the series A and B stage. We'll opportunistically write later stage checks when we really know a company so well, like with our, our investment into Rapid, for example, you know, that was really just a, a big double down on, on an earlier stage bet. You know, we believe in loyalty. We believe in really staying, really backing our founders for the long haul. And so we'd rather just have a much more concentrated portfolio of founders we've developed very close relationships with, where we truly have been an extension of their team um, and where we are, are just big believers in what they're building and that we have the capital reserves to keep backing them all the way through the journey. That's a, uh, that's a perfect place to, to, to wrap. Uh, my guest today has been Addie Lerner of Avid Ventures. Uh, Addie, thanks so much for coming to the podcast. It's been a great episode. Thank you, Eric. It was a lot of fun. Boom. If you're an early stage entrepreneur, we'd love to hear from you. Check us out at villageglobal.vc.